Welcome to How to Yu-Gi-Oh! Tips and Tricks Part 12 Archetype Guide. In this video, I'm just going to give a guide to archetypes, how you find good and bad archetypes, and how this helps you in building better decks and being a better Yu-Gi-Oh! player. Okay, in front of you, I'm sure you can see the screen. When I look at an archetype, there are three things. First of all, one is direction, two, realistic implementation of effects, and three, full mastery of oneself. Let's start with the first topic, direction. In my eyes, it's very important when you look at a new archetype that it has direction. Facts. What I mean by direction, that when you look at the overall archetype in its first wave, that there's a general consensus or goal that the archetype is trying to achieve. The truth you need to know. Whether it's to making um, a full negation board, whether it's to be very disruptive, whatever the goal or direction of the archetype in question may be when it's new, there's a sort of uh, you know dream that the archetype has set up for itself and it can achieve this dream through various means and through various cards and effects that facilitate this dream. That's really convenient. A lack of direction, though, is a serious problem and can be the barriers to entry in terms of being a decent deck. Are you serious? Now, whether it can even be a competitive deck in the meta scene, that is yet to be seen. But the issue is, lack of direction definitely means it is not entering the competitive scene in any shape or form, which is not good. Let's give an example of a deck with a lack of direction at the moment, and that is purely. On Purely's first wave of support, as you see in Amazing Defenders, we are completely lost, right? While we have effects and ways to XYZ summon, what is the goal here? What is the end board? Is it to make, it's just to make Zeus? Is there something else? Like, could there be better things we could be doing with Purely, for example? Um, because they're only level one, we can't be using Sprite, and we can't be using other spicy stuff. Or maybe we could use um, Melfi, perhaps? Or could we use uh, Tri Brigade? Again, we are lacking vision to what Purely does best. With a lack of direction here, we don't know the, the speciality of Purely. And as a result, we don't know what to do with it. Why well, you got to be so complicated? Herein lies the problem. A lack of direction means a lack of focus and means we don't know what we're doing. That's not good. So it's very important when you look at a new archetype, especially whatever set you're in, that it has some form of direction. No matter how small or big it may be, it might be even be a bit crazy, but it doesn't matter. The archetype in question needs to have some form of direction. So let's go to point two, and this is realistic implementation of effects. This includes the gimmicks that the archetype has. For example, let's talk about Mikanko. Mikanko is another archetype that comes out, that came out in Amazing Defenders. So it has this gimmick of using equips. This is a, okay, we get this gimmick, but let's look at it realistically. Do we have um, a plethora of cards in the game that search equip cards in a realistic and uh, essential way? No! Does the archetype provide any ways of searching equips in a realistic and feasible way? Highly unlikely. We don't know how to implement this equip mechanic. Is We don't have uh, loads of ways outside of Mikanko to search equips. We don't see the benefits of equips as Mikanko doesn't like do something unique with them or turn just average equips into something special. Could they make equips produce uh, tokens so that we could use them for ritual summoning, for example? No! Do they do something special with these equips? Do they have to use Kanko equips? How about regular equips? What are we doing here? Like, this is the problem. Like, where the implementation of these, of this gimmick, how useful is it? Why are you asking questions? Don't ask questions. Trying to build a foundation here, and we have no foundation here. This is the problem of lack of realistic implementation of effects. A gimmick is only a gimmick if it can realistically be used in the game. Facts. Without a solid foundation, 
we have problems. And this is the issue with Nikanko at the moment. There's no solid foundation. There's no solid bedrock to stand on. All it has are gimmicks, but we don't know how to use them and how to implement them effectively. Because we have no way of using uh, equip spells in a realistic uh, way. While we have a card like Hidden Armory, again, Hidden Armory has an effect that touches equip spells, which is great. But it's the negative side that comes from its activation cannot be ignored here, which completely hinders Mikanko as a whole. We need something that's a bit better when it comes to searching equip spells. Now, you may use Isolde again, which dumps the equip spells in the grave, but again, we need to search and add those equips to our hand, not send them to the graveyard. This, we got problems here, and yeah. So overall, that's the heuristic invitation of effects. And finally, we go to full mastery of oneself. This is very important. Um, this falls in line with direction, but it is a bit deeper and a bit and it's a bit more nuanced than that. When I talk about full mastery of, of oneself, we look, let's look at a positive example, which is Rescue Ace. Now, is Rescue Ace in Raising Defenders, is it the best deck? No! But why does this deck look more attractive to players? And why does it look more appealing to play? And that when we look at it, we are drawn to it. Does not sound too bad. For the simple reason that, first of all, it has expectations for itself, but it's realistic in how it implements its own effects and it has full mastery of how it implements its own effects. It's important to know your strengths and your weaknesses and we see this with um, Rescue Ace. We see Rescue Ace and the way the effects are implemented in it that it subconsciously knows its strengths and knows its weaknesses. Like for example, it knows it, because it is not a fast deck, so it has in archetype cards to slow down the opponent with a trap card like Contain. Um, because it cannot protect itself, it has uh, cards like uh, Fire Extinguisher to protect uh, its cards, monsters and spells or traps from targeting or protection. Because it needs a little boost to just speed up its plays, also the Extinguisher is the way to fight extinguisher rescue as we see there is a way to speed up its place and get its place going now is obviously it takes a lot to to start its engines but the point is it it dares to care and it dares to dream it has a full mastery of what it can do it knows first of all it knows what it wants to do it knows how to get there and it knows the end result and this is important when it comes to looking at an archetype full mastery of oneself know thyself and thou shalt beat thy enemy knowing yourself is is only half the battle it's only when you know yourself that you can know that you will you should then take the time to learn your enemy for example let's look at one of the best decks that epitomizes this phrase of full master of oneself, which is Flunderies. Flunderies is one of the best examples of a deck that has full mastery of itself. Is Flunderies the best deck? No! But why is Flunderies um, in the top spot of the competitive scene time and time again? Because Flunderies basically has mastered itself and has said this. When it comes to the normal summon, I am king. I am number one. In every other field, I will lose. But when it comes to normal summon, no one can beat me. I own the normal summon. I am the normal summon, and no one beats me in normal summon. And indeed, that is how Flunderies is. When it comes to everything else with Flunderies, it's pretty garbage. But when it comes to the normal summon, Flunderies is is exceptional. And there is no archetype in Yu-Gi-Oh! in Yu-Gi-Oh's history that can do a normal summon as efficiently as Flunderies. And indeed, when you master yourself, you can even enter the competitive scene. Not even that, you can be at a complete annoyance and a nuisance, and you can just cause people a bad day. And this is one of the reasons why Flunderies is such a good deck. It's a good deck because it does one thing, and it does that one thing exceptionally well. And indeed, when you fully master yourself, you can do incredible things. You can even defy the odds 
and maybe beat the gods, i.e. the Metasain, and completely dominate time and time and time again. There we go. So these are the three things that I talk about when it comes to archetypes. And these, I feel, are the guide you need, the guidelines you need to be using when you're looking at archetypes. So it comes down to the direction. And direction, as we said, is the overall goal of the deck, the overall vision that the deck has for itself when you look at it and its overall effects. We have their realistic implementation of effects. This includes the, this is talking about the deck, the archetypes gimmick that it has on there. Are they realistic and can they be implemented in a realistic way? You know, uh, they're not just being a gimmick for gimmick's sake, but they can be implemented in a realistic way and we can use them and apply them in ways which are actually realistic. And also another thing is, do they add something new to the table? It's not also about, you know, uh, uh, taking things from the game, it's about putting things into the game. For example, let's look at Runix. Why are Runix, why were they so successful? For one thing, because they brought something new to the table. While yes, they did have a way of just, uh, you, do, you didn't do a battle phrase, so they took something out, but they brought something in, in the aspect of each one of the Runic quick plays allows you to special summon a monster, a uh, Runic monster from the extra deck. Each one of them have effects that after resolution, they uh, banish, you know, uh, a certain amount of cards from the opponent's deck face up. So they have extra effects on top of the other effects that they have on them. This is a way to add something new to the uh, deck destruction formula and at the same time do something different. And this is what we want to see in a new archetype. We want to see its identity. We want to see how it realistically implements its gimmicks in a new and unique way. And finally, we have full mastery of oneself. This is talking about how you go out there as a new archetype and how you know your limits, knowing what you can and cannot do. And we see this with Flounderies. Flounderies especially, we can see this very clearly. Flounderies is an archetype with its effects, it has a self-awareness. It knows when it comes to normal summoning, it is the best at it and there's no one better at normal summoning than Flunderies, and so, and so it uses this to its advantage. Every single effect in Flunderies is, uh, is designed to, towards its strength. And because everything is designed towards its strength, its uh, strength chart is kind of skewered into the normal summon to an absurd degree to the point that it barely has any weakness. Um, and it just becomes absurdly strong just because it's skewered towards its greater strength to such a high level degree and indeed that's what we see here so remember when looking at an archetype to follow these three major points well that's all i've got to say about um archetypes hopefully you find this useful and hopefully you'll use this guide to help you um find good archetypes and play you know archetype that you like and see new things that you've not seen before well that's all i've got to say i'll see you next time on Sil on silver bones goodbye we come to the end of this video so as i like to say you are one step closer to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh master my fate right is in your hands